Hey, hello everyone, welcome back. So in the next series of videos, we will be creating our first stake pool. It will be interesting, will be fun, perhaps sometimes challenging, but we will get there, just bear with us. To create a stake pool, we need to think about how it looks like first. Let me just bring this article and in particular this diagram because I think it will help uh, have a shared understanding of how the setup should look like. So as a stick pool, we'll have a block producer. This block producer node is of course running a Cardano node and it will start with a number of keys. These keys are the ones that are actually enabling this node as a block producer. Our stake pool will also have at least one, but ideally two or more relay nodes. Well, these relay nodes are responsible for propagating the blocks that we produce with our block producer. They are the ones that receive first our blocks and they will help us to distribute or to communicate, to propagate our blocks to the rest of the network, to the other peers that they are connected to. So, this is like the core of a stake pool. A block producer node with a couple of relays. So this block producer will connect only to its own relays, while the relays will connect to its own block producer, but also to other peers in the network. So we just checked uh, how to prepare our configuration files and our topology files. So just to revisit that, the block producer will have on its local route only its own relays. The public route section will be empty on the topology file because we don't want the block producer to actually connect to anyone else. And of course, again, when we go to the use ledger after a slot, we will use a negative number, number uh, minus one is good, uh, because we never want to use ledger peers in our block producer. On the contrary, our relay nodes will have the block producer and the other relay on its local routes, one, two, three other peers on the public routes, and we will use use ledger after a slot. Usually the default number will be fine, and we want actually peer-to-peer, -peer. we want the node to actually discover the peers in the network that we want to connect to. Remember that we want to have a target of somewhere around 15 or 20 uh, other peers, but we will allow peer-to-peer -to, -peer to actually do its job and find those peers for us. So we don't, uh, we don't need to actually put too many um, other relay nodes, other peers in our topology file. So without having to talk too much about security, because that is not of part of the scope of this course, uh, just as a rule of thumb, uh, and you want to have your block producer very well secured uh, behind a firewall, and you want to make sure that it only accepts connection, incoming connections from its own relays, of course, apart from the SSH connection, where you are connecting to your node or to your server to actually configure it, prepare it, maintain it, and all of that. But in terms of open ports, you will want to have an open port for least, uh, for your node where these relays will be able to contact. Perhaps an open port for monitoring and nothing else. Just close everything else. Your relays nodes will be accepting connections, incoming connections from other peers in the network, as well as from your block producer. Of course, SSH port open, and perhaps as well some uh, ports open for monitoring and, and nothing else. Everything else should be just closed and secure. But again, security of the servers is not part of the scope of this course. Just quick overview. Of course, you will need a machine, uh, a local machine where you uh, work 
and actually prepare everything and monitor everything. But apart from this machine, you really want to have an air gap machine. This air gap machine is something like what I have over here. It's a laptop that has its network card disabled. And it's a machine that is just doesn't have any access to the internet at all. And that is important because we want this machine to be very secure. So I have a fresh installation of Linux. I have uh, bring Cardano CLI to it and nothing else. It's clean. And that is because it will be holding my cold keys. The cold keys are like the core, the, the, the master keys of your stake pool. And you want them to live in a secure space. Also, you will be using your ergat machine to generate your payment keys. You will be using that to generate the stake keys. You will be using that for generating the cast keys, the VRF keys, the operational certificate, and the operational certificate counter. We will see in a minute what they are. But you will produce all those artifacts within this ergat machine. And you will use this method of bringing this through a USB stick uh, to your working machine and then upload it via SSH to your block producer. So your block producer will need these three artifacts, the CAS signing key, the BRF signing key, and the operational certificate. We will see in a minute what they are for. But you want to avoid generating things and keeping things here in your block producer or in any of your relays. You really need to make sure that you have this kind of setup because uh, it is all about security. And of course, it is critical if you are aiming for a mainnet stake pool. If you want to have a stake pool on mainnet, you really need to put uh, this kind of security, this kind of, uh, uh, of air gap between your keys and the production. So apart from that, let me just talk a little bit about those artifacts that we will be creating. Our stake pool will require what we call cold keys. And these cold keys are used to register a stake pool to control the stake pool parameters, to issue operational certificate, and to retire the stake pool if needed. And they are referred to as cold because of this. They are supposed to be living in a very cold environment, in the air gap machine. We have the BRF keys, which are used for the slot leader election process and to contribute to the evolving nodes, to the randomness of the system. And these keys will live on the block producer node, but we will produce them on the air gap machine. Then we have the operational keys, also called key evolving signature keys, CAS keys, and they are used together with the operational certificate to actually sign the blocks. Then we have the operational certificate, which is uh, used to transfer staking rights from the cold keys to the CAS keys. So this is some sort of a delegation certificate where we transfer the rights from the cold to the hot or cast keys. The certificate is included in every block header of the blocks that we produce, of course. And we also have this operational certificate counter. This artifact is used to determine the precedence. So a certificate with a higher counter overrides one with a lower, lower counter. Having said that, I think we are just ready to actually go and start generating the things that we will need. But that will be part of the next video, so see you there. Thank you.